conflict. It's your favorite thing. It's your it, love language. My first question is, why is it so hard? So we have a, a culture that said doesn't doesn't do conflict, we do war. If somebody says something that hurts your feelings, the only options we have is to thumbs down you and to respond like lob a grenade back. and welcome to The Christy Wright Show, where faith meets personal development so you can have a bigger faith and a better life. I'm so excited because today we are talking all about conflict. Yeah, are you uncomfortable yet? It's gonna get good. And then I get to sit down with my good friend, fellow Ramsey personality, Dr. John Deloney, and he's gonna teach us how to do conflict well. But first, let's talk about conflict and how it affects your most important relationships. Now, I gotta tell you, I remember, maybe it was in the first few months of marriage, this specific moment when Matt, my husband, made me really mad. Now, I don't even know what he did. I just know I was really mad about it. So I'm in the kitchen and I am just scrubbing dishes, just fuming, having an entire fight with him in my head that he knows nothing about. He comes into the kitchen and senses the rage radiating from the sink and he asks me the most logical question. Are you mad? Now, what do most people do in this scenario? What do you do, if you're honest? You say, no, no, I'm not mad. You start violently scrubbing even more. You're slamming dishes. You're slamming cabinet. Oh, not mad at all. Not mad at all. Feeling great. We're doing awesome. You're just scrubbing even harder. They're like, I don't know. I'm sensing that you might be mad. No, mm -mm, mm -mm. no, we're great, right? You do that, don't you? I know you do, and maybe if your spouse asks another 47 or 48 or 49 times, maybe eventually you will admit that you're mad, but by that time, you are so wired and fired up that the fight has escalated in your mind to ridiculous proportions. Or maybe you hold out so long that you're not mad that eventually he stops asking and you convince yourself it was never worth bringing up in the first place just sweep it under the rug, right? Just gonna keep the peace. We're just gonna sweep it under the rug. We're gonna be the bigger person. It's not worth fighting about. And you move on and you know that resentment is still there. So when my husband came into the kitchen at this moment and I am scrubbing the dishes and I am very visibly mad and he asks me one time, are you mad? I did exactly what I always do. I said, yes, I'm mad and I'm mad at you. And here's why. I didn't like that you did this and this hurt my feelings and I didn't like this. And to this day, I have no idea what he actually did. I just know I was real mad about it. But in that moment as newlyweds, my husband was shocked. He was shocked that he asked me if I was mad and I was honest, yes, I'm mad. That hurt my feelings. Yes, I'm mad. I didn't like that. Now, this is one area of life where I am not like most people. I don't mind conflict. Conflict doesn't phase me one bit. I don't mind engaging, but there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Because to this day, when someone asks me if I'm mad and I'm honest, yeah, I'm mad, I didn't like that. Or when I volunteer those feelings un, unsolicited, hey, um, I didn't really like that. Hey, that, that email, that kind of rubbed me the wrong way or that didn't sit right with me. Can we talk about it? People are shocked when I'm honest. Not offended. They're not offended, but they are shocked. Why? Why are people shocked when I'm honest? Or maybe you, if you're like me, when you're honest, why are people shocked? Because we live in a culture of liars that say they're not mad when they are. We live in a culture where in the name of keeping the peace, we sweep everything under the rug over and over again. But let me tell you something, your rug is so full, no one can walk on it because that crap is still there. And it's eating away at you because you're not willing to engage in healthy, respectful, open communication and healthy conflict. We live in a culture that doesn't know how to do conflict well. We are so scared of conflict that we shy away from it entirely or we're awkward whenever we try to engage. And so normally we just avoid it. But let me tell you, conflict is not dangerous. In fact, the opposite is true. Lack of conflict can be dangerous. It can eat away at your marriage 
if you continually sweep things under the rug. As my friend Les Parrott says, all of those issues have a high rate of resurrection. They come back. They may come out next week. They may come out next year. They may come out in 10 years. But they didn't go away if you didn't address the problem with the person you love the most. Lack of conflict and lack of communication also eats away at trust and intimacy. If your spouse asks you over and over again if you're mad and you are visibly mad scrubbing the dishes so violently the dish is falling apart and you continually say no, they know you're lying. That eats away at the trust between you two. You're being dishonest. It even puts a wedge in your intimacy, in your open communication, in your foundation that your marriage is built on. When we start to see conflict as a threat and as dangerous and as negative, then of course we're not gonna engage in it. That's why we have to look at conflict as a positive. Healthy, open communication. Being willing to respect the other person enough to be honest. Honest about how you feel. Honest about what you need. Honest about what you're going through. Honest about how you disagree on some issue and being willing to engage and lean in and clear the air and respect them enough and show them the dignity to work through it with them. That's what conflict is. It's just healthy, open communication. It's respecting the other person enough to show up and work through the problems that you have. Because just because you say there aren't problems doesn't mean there aren't problems. Just because you say you're not mad doesn't mean you're not mad. The truth is still there of what's going on in your relationships. And if you're not willing to engage in healthy, open communication, in healthy conflict to work through those issues, it's eating away at your relationship. It's damaging your intimacy. It's damaging your trust and your very foundation. But when you're willing to, when you're willing to be honest, When your spouse comes home and you had a heck of a day and you seem frazzled and they say, are you upset? And you go, yeah, I am. I thought you were gonna be home an hour earlier and I was banking on it and dinner was ready and now dinner's cold and I feel disrespected because I thought you were gonna be here an hour ago. So I'm I'm pretty frustrated. Can we talk about it? You are gonna come through on the other side of that conflict healthier, stronger, closer, with even more trust between you. If if conflict is done well, it actually brings you closer together. You know, I have a funny um, example of this because as we all know, I am a very Enneagram 8 approach to conflict. And so I love conflict, doesn't phase me one bit. I'm like, game on. Are 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 we getting closer right now as we fight? I think we are. This is fantastic. Apparently, everyone else doesn't feel that way about conflict. So Rachel Cruz and I are very good friends, as most of you all probably know. And we uh, go back and forth on Marco Polo. Like we just talk and catch up on Marco Polo in between, which is an app on your phone, just a video chat app. We'll keep up on that in between our hangouts. Well, there was one week, this was several months ago, there was one week in particular where she said something that just hurt my feelings. It just did. And she and I have never had anything like that in our friendship. And so Marco Polo and her back, I was like, hey, I, I know you didn't mean anything by it, but I just want you to know that kind of hurt my feelings. And I just wanted you to know, and you know, we're close enough where I figure you can handle that. I just wanted to tell you that hurt my feelings. And she, Mark goes back. She's like, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. Thank you so much for telling me. And that was that, right? Like there was no back and forth. It wasn't a disagreement or an argument. It was just letting her know something that hurt my feelings. Literally like a week later, something happened where I hurt her feelings. And she marked me back. She's like, hey, Yeah, we just had this conversation last week and it's so ironic because now I'm on the other side, but I just wanted you to know that you said this thing and it kind of rubbed me the wrong way and I just wanted you to know. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I had no idea I did that. It wasn't intentional and so on. (laughs) She Marcos me back. Marco Polo, sends me a Marco Polo message back. And she goes, I'm just so grateful for your friendship and how we can do conflict. Like there's not a lot of people that I can do conflict with. And I just, I feel such trust with you and such a closeness with you that like I'm safe enough to share with you something. You're safe enough to share something with me that we can do conflict well. I'm just so thankful that we can do conflict together. (laughs) And I send her a message back. I go, girl, that wasn't conflict. That was just open communication. (laughs) She was like, you are such an eight. Only eights would see this as this positive, fun communication. But really, any of us, in any personality style, whether you're a male or female, introvert or extrovert, we can look at conflict 
as an opportunity to engage, an opportunity to build trust, an opportunity to have healthy, honest, and open communication. And what I think you'll find If you're willing to do this, if you're willing to be honest about how you feel, if you're willing to engage with the people that you love the most on this level, I think you'll find that not only does it improve your relationship, but the other person is actually even grateful for it. We were drawn to Christian Healthcare Ministries because we both had young families and we wanted to have more children. And we had also just started a real estate company and needed to find healthcare coverage that would meet our needs. We were attracted to CHM because of its low monthly costs and the ability to negotiate medical costs down. Established in 1981 and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, CHM is here to meet the needs of your growing family or small business. Check us out at chministries.org. We absolutely believe in it. All right, y'all, I'm so excited because I get to hang out with my good friend, fellow Ramsey personality, Dr. John Deloney, host of The John Deloney Show, which let's just go ahead and tell them a little bit about your show. If my show is like (laughs) Disney rated G, (laughs) let's talk about friendship and life balance. Deloney's show is like rated R slash weird. You get the weirdest questions I've ever heard. It's Netflix (laughs) where you have to go through the filter for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I wouldn't watch my, I let my kids scroll through that menu. Somebody, 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 uh, uh, what do the kids call it? They DM'd me. They sent me a a message on the Instagrams and it said (laughs) me and my 12 year old were, were, laughing at something, and I just stopped. It's like, no. No. Not for your 12-year-old. Not yeah. child-friendly. You yeah. get a lot of <laughs> weird calls, yes. weird questions, weird situations, and you handle them so well. I mean, Obviously. you have an incredible background of being able to counsel people, advise people, and that's why I wanted to bring you back on the show, because you've been on the show before. I love and, this show, because you ask the hardest questions. Great. They're so good for my that's, soul. That's a compliment for okay. me. I like to make it difficult. Good. Here's the thing we're talking about <laughs> today. Difficult. Here's the thing we're talking about today that I want to dig into, because this is something that I hear about a lot. It affects relationships. You know a lot about relationships and how to have healthy ones with your spouse, but anybody, okay. for that matter, co-workers, friendships, whatever. Conflict. Conflict. It's your favorite thing. It's your it, love language. I'm, it's the Christian right. It, my my first heartbeat. question is, why is it so hard? And I'm speaking hypothetically for others because for me it is not so much. But for others, hypothetically, <laughs> for most people, truly, for most people, it's hard, it's uncomfortable, it's awkward, it is... It makes them their chest mm. tight. And I'm not going to say, like, I super enjoy it. There are moments that I get tense and nervous of how to approach things. Let's just talk about conflict in general. Okay. Why is this so hard mm. for people and scary? Yeah, I, I think we have no models for it. Okay. So we have a, a culture that set, doesn't doesn't do conflict, we do war. And so there is no, if somebody says something that hurts your feelings, there is no picture of what it looks like to, to call them and say, How hey, do you do it well? That hurt, and I know you didn't mean that, but let's talk about that. The only thing, the only options we have is to thumbs down you and to respond like lob a grenade back, right? Yeah. So that's one. And the other thing is we live in a culture, I'm working through with this with my counselor right now. Yeah, real time. So this is real time, everybody. I can't wait. <laughs> is we can just leave. What do you mean by that? We can say things like our marriage just, we did it for 10 years and it's just, it, yeah, it, it hard, naturally so concluded. Mm. Um, my kids don't make me be the best me, so I'm not going to be around them as much. I'll see them on the weekends, right? Mm. I can go work somewhere else. I can go get another degree. I can borrow some money and go get another car and get another apartment. We have so many options. Mm-hmm. Conflict makes us feel broken, like something's wrong with us, so we just leave. Mm-hmm. I don't think ever before in the history of time have people had the ability to just walk out on a problem. Mm-hmm. And so it's a skill that we've, we, we've, we've not had to nurture because I'm, I'm just going to go do something else. How does, I'm curious too, and I was just thinking as you were talking, how does how we were raised and what we observed in our own family units and our household, how does that affect how we view conflict? Because I, uh, I've i seen some extremes, mm-hmm. you know, and I mean, I have my own family experience mm-hmm. growing up um, where you have, I'll use generalizations here for just for teaching purposes. You have one family where it's like, hypothetically, they're all extroverts. They all lean into conflict, maybe like, maybe just share it a little too much. Like every thought that enters their mind, they don't filter it, they don't think, they don't consider. They're just like, everybody just hashes everything out all the time to a point of maybe unhealthy, where it's just so over the top. You might have another extreme of a family unit and they don't talk about anything Mm -hmm. ever. And so these kids are raised, which now let's say like my audience are these adult, Mm -hmm. you know, adults now that were raised in these families and they didn't have language for it. 
they didn't know how to proceed in a healthy way, in a yeah. respectful way, in an honest way. And so they feel like, well, I'm being the bigger person, keeping the peace, sweeping it under the rug. I'm doing the right thing by not addressing it. And so they don't do conflict at all. And as we know, that builds up in an unhealthy yeah, way too. Yeah. So do you see that our family unit, how we were raised and what we observed in our own um, created a framework for us, good or bad, yeah. in how we view conflict and how we recreate it in our own families and lives? There's a really remarkable book called Nurture Shock. And one of the things, one of the big takeaways from that book, it came out of like maybe a decade ago, but our parents were taught if they're going to be intentional, don't fight in front of the kids. Mm -hmm. Take yes. it in the back bedroom, shut the door, y'all do your thing, mm -hmm. and then come back out and be a united front. Mm -hmm. And the heart behind that was good, mm -hmm. right? But what they did was they robbed kids of what a picture looks like when two people love each other and disagree mm -hmm. and then still love each other. Right. And so we all think if we fight, if we're uncomfortable, well, that must mean this thing's over, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because we never saw what that looked like. Or the other thing was unintentional parents just went to war. Yeah. And we don't want that in our houses either. Right. Because that sets off every Screaming, fear alarm yelling. we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So kids find themselves on either side of that, of that teeter-totter with any discomfort, fighting, yelling, mm -hmm. I'm out. Yeah. Right. Because I don't have a I don't have a picture for what that looks like. I'm out of here. Yeah. Right. I'm either broken or this marriage is or this relationship doesn't work. Okay. What about personality? How does that play into? Because we joke about like Enneagram's yeah. eights. I'm like, oh, like I will just go head on into yeah. it. I'm like, oh, yeah, that made me mad. I didn't like that. Let's yeah. talk about it. You you've seen me do this. <laughs> Upstairs in our off, like her desk, kids, maybe couple couple next to down. mine. He's watched it happen, but, but it's one of those things where certain personalities are seem to be. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert on personality differences, but seem to be more leaning into conflict, while more are uh, some are lean back even more. It's even scarier. It's yeah. even more intimidating, uncomfortable. Um, you know, I, I have friends that are they're more of the peacemaker personality, and they are petrified. Of conflict, my friend. I always joke about my friend Jenny. She's like the nicest person. I wrote about her in my in my book coming out this fall because she never wants to say no. So she struggles to you know protect her time or set boundaries. We'll be out to dinner, and uh, you know they'll bring her food, and it's completely wrong order. Like she'll order the chicken, and they'll bring her steak, and she's like, "Oh, I really wanted the chicken." I'm like, "Well, send it back." She's like, oh, mm. No. No, I'm like, you asked for one thing, they accidentally brought you the other. It's this cool, is man. a very it's it's a very normal thing to say. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm sure you can do it in a nice way. Yeah. Oh no no. She'll just keep the steak. Just eat it. <laughs> Jenny. So how does personality? Like <laughs> yeah. How does personality play into our ability to engage with conflict in a healthy way? And how does it hold us back? You know? So I'm kind of a skeptic when it comes to all of the You're a skeptic to personality everything. stuff. <laughs> yeah. like I'm this. Here's the thing. When we're uncomfortable or we're faced with what I would call a threat of any kind. Okay. I ordered this food, you brought me that one. Mm -hmm. I needed this from you tonight when I got home from work, you gave me this. Mm -hmm. We f we flee or we fight. Mm -hmm. And some of us have a default setting that's like, I'm I'm cool, I'm out of here. And then some of us are like, I'm trapped and I'm stuck and I'm coming through you. That's <laughs> the only way I can do <laughs> yeah, this, right? Yeah. I gotta come through you. Bull doesn't do it. Either way, it's a defense mechanism against mm -hmm. I needed something and whatever wasn't there to give it to me. Mm -hmm. And it, it could be, I didn't say it right. I don't want to fight about it. I needed something. I didn't get it. And so some people come after you. Yeah. And then we have all, I mean, a million different personality assessments and traits yeah. and this is and that's and all yeah. the Enneagram yeah, yeah. voodoo witchcraft. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But all that stuff. But it really comes down to what do I do when I yeah. feel threatened? Yeah. And I'm going to come through you. I'm going to run away. And some of us just freeze. Yeah. And so everybody has a coping mechanism, a defense right. mechanism, yeah. regardless of your personality style, when you're faced with that. that it's threat. just our body's trying to keep us safe. Okay, so how do we do it well? How do we do conflict well? How do we mm. have uncomfortable conversations? Let's say that there is someone watching right now and they're right in the middle of this. Yeah. And they're like, man, maybe it's a workplace environment or maybe it's something with their spouse or a, a family member. And like, this, this makes me very uncomfortable. I don't like that they did this. I feel like I've been wronged. I feel like I need to stand up for myself in a very appropriate, respectful way, but it's conflict. It's yeah. disagreement or unmet expectations. How does someone proceed in a way that is honoring, respectful, but honest yeah. and not pretending it's not there because that's not healthy either. Right. So how do we do that? How do we do it well? I think the first thing you have to do is disconnect from that moment. Anytime the emotion you, of anytime it? you go okay. to war in a moment or you flee in a moment, everybody loses. Mm. And anytime you're in a relationship and you're working through relationship, 
anyone, time there's a one and a loss, you both lose, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So if I go to war with my boss, I want more money and I deserve it, I've been doing this, and I get more money, we've both lost. Mm. I've burned social capital there. Yeah. I'm not gonna get another raise. And if an opportunity comes up, he, he or she is gonna remember that dude. I didn't like right? how that went, yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Or with my spouse, anytime I'm like, you know what, I've been saving it up. And <laughs> my wife, she's actually wrong. She's, she was wrong on this one. Uh -huh. And I, man, For I come once. in. I, I know, finally, <laughs> finally. I come after it and I win. Yeah. We both lose. Yeah. And so I think the right way to do conflict, number one, is to, to pull the emotion out of it. Okay. And to say, what am I actually, is it, Am I unclear? Am, what am I scared of? What am I threatened by in this thing? And then the purpose of conflict is to connect, mm. not to win. Mm. And if I, that, that may mean I'm not gonna get that money I'm gonna talk about. What am I really threatened by? This place doesn't value me. Mm. My, I'm not having my needs met by my partner and I'm not saying them right. right. right? I'm not talking right. about, how am I gonna connect here? Yeah. Right. And then at the end of the day, if, if you go to connect with somebody and then they come back at you, mm -hmm. well then you've got a message that the relationship has some dysfunction, in, mm. right? And then you have another avenue you need to, to deal with. Yeah, that's so interesting. One of the things I've always um, struggled with, with just being a dominant personality style, more of the, uh -huh. the aggressor, which no one's surprised by in this room, um, is the um, the need to be right. Like when mm. I believe I'm right, it's like I need to make sure that we all know where I'm right. Like I, I feel so convicted, like I feel like this deep conviction about it, but um, I read something recently. I was reading uh, Soul Keeping by John Orberg, uh -huh, yeah. and he cites Dallas Willard throughout the whole book. And one of the things that he he cites as a quote from Dallas Willard is something to the effect of, I'm, I'm going <clears> to <throat> not say it exactly, but he said, one of the hardest things in the world is to be right and not hurt others with your rightness. Yeah, that's weapon, and I thought, it? yeah, and I thought that's so interesting because if I can give up my need to be right, and the way that I've phrased it in the past is if I can choose... I want reconciliation more than I want to be right. I want connection. Yeah, then it then it changes how I engage the relationship, how I engage, engage the conversation. But if I come at the conversation as, I want to be right and make sure you know I'm right, mm -hmm. then I approach it differently and you get a very different result to your point versus pulling the emotion out of it and focusing on the connection piece mm -hmm. as the end game or reconciliation. What, what's your end game, yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. this, <laughs> we had this conversation in a long counseling session last night. So okay, I'm going to ask you. great. Somebody somebody challenges you. Yeah. You say, I think it's this, and they make that face, and they're like, why? Mm -hmm. Right then, mm -hmm. it's on. Oh, I may or may you not have seen just it. walked into the it. boxing ring. That's right. I'm so glad you're here. So, Fantastic. What is it about that challenge? Yeah. This is maybe a weird word. No, no, no. What, what is it about that challenge that scares you? So, okay, this is... I might need to come back to that because my initial feelings, if I was going to like name a feeling when that happens, there is a threat of like, okay, this is a, a, a battle to be right. But there's also in a part of it, and I know I joke about the Enneagram, but th there is an engagement and debate that I enjoy. Okay. Like I, I think, like I wish I would have been in the debate club in high school because it's just fun. I could debate either side of things just because I enjoy engaging in that way. Almost like like you enjoy playing soccer, two different teams. Right. You know, it's like, it's a, it's a sport. It's a sport. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Everyone is like, what is wrong with you <laughs> that this is a sport to you? It's it's a uh, 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 it's a different level of intimacy. It's a different yeah, level yeah, yeah. Of, yeah, of engagement. And then if I, like, I'll, I'll give you a real-time example. I have done this with Dave mm -hmm. many times. Yes. And there's one specific instance where I just, I just kept on. I was like, but what about this? What about this? We were, we were on a plane, uh, this was years ago, on a plane somewhere. It was probably a two-hour flight. And we spent 45 minutes of it. In that instance, I totally lost. Like, I lost that fight. Okay. He totally won. Not just because he's a CEO, but because he was right. Okay. Like, I, 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 with all the back and forth, I came out of the boxing ring the loser okay. in this situation. And I was like, that was great. But I loved it. But I loved it. That was so great. How can you lose a fight and still be so happy about it? So there's something about me that enjoys the— Sparring, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, it, and it's, I think it's just I love communication. I love—to um, me, it's a form of intimacy, a, a healthy, normal intimacy and, and engagement. But when you say, like, the threat, I think a lot of times, and we all experience this regardless of your personality style, um, at our deepest level, many of us just believe that we're right about that thing. Mm -hmm. And so when someone threatens that, you're like, but but no, I'm right. I'm right about this thing. Sure. My my husband, Matt, we both come at conflict from the same exact place. We're right. Mm -hmm. I'm right just because I decide that I am. Gotcha. Because I'm an eight. He's right because he's researched it enough. Uh -huh. He has all the information. He I can show you. what he's talking about. He's just kidding. I'm kidding. We're going to edit. Someone edit him out. <laughs> 
but but we both come at it from this deep conviction that we're right, yeah. regardless of where it came from. So um, so yeah, I don't know. I think I think for me, there's a threat of like my rightness, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. But then there's also an enjoyment of it. So the challenge I received last night okay. was when. What was your answer? I'm I'm more like Matt. Okay. Like I'm I will. I will feel that somebody challenges me, uh-huh. and instantly my thought is, "Oh gosh, did I hurt them?" Oh, and so I back You're so out. Nice. I back out. You're so considerate. <laughs> well, it's considerate, but it's all about me. It's okay. all about me. Okay. And then I start scrolling through. Did I hurt them? How did I hurt them? Why would that have been hurtful? And how can I get myself out of this? Okay. Right. Okay. Which is very similar to, "Oh, you want to challenge me? You want to go? Let's do this." And the feedback I got, which was right, is. Whether I'm unplugging or someone's coming over the top, that whole engagement is not relationship. Mm-hmm. That engagement is me fulfilling me. Yep. Right. Yep. And it was as stopping the presses and saying, "Hey, that's I feel like you're challenging me, and that makes me uncomfortable and mm-hmm. scared. Did I hurt you?" Mm-hmm. Versus starting the my whatever routine I've got. Okay. Right? Okay. And so when two eights get in a room, you, <laughs> like when you're with Dave, we all know this is awesome, right? It's like y'all I, like to get popcorn and just watch. Oh, yeah, and and when I go back and forth with Dave, he likes coming over the top, and I like dragging the whole ship yeah. down really slow, <laughs> very discreetly, until everyone's qu- sinking. <laughs> My wife said yesterday, she's like, "Stop talking in your little hostage negotiator voice. We're in a fight." And I was like, uh, "But what do you feel?" She's like, and "So it's a weapon too, oh, right?" Yeah, yeah. But it's. How can I keep leaning into this thing and not let my fight or flight just take this whole thing? And not let it be about me and what I need. That's so interesting. So one of the things that we've talked about before, because this whole idea of conflict, there's a lot of sources of it, miscommunication, unmet expectations, whatever. You taught me something maybe like a year ago, more than that. And I remember, I don't even remember the context. It was like in passing. You and I were up there in the office and we were talking about something. And you said, ask your husband what does that look like to you when you when you make plans? Because we think in pictures and we talk in words. And I was like, what? Uh, speaking of like all this like mind tricks, I was like, what are you talking about? Like walk me through this. And you said, our, our brain, when you imagine, hey, let's go on a date tonight, you picture what date night looks like. And then if date night doesn't look like yeah. what you had in your head, there's unmet expectations, there's resentment, there's I thought we were gonna do this, thought we were gonna do that. And that has so stuck with me. It's so brilliant because I use that now. We say, hey, what are we gonna do on Saturday? Oh, let's just stay home. So in my mind, what am I thinking? Oh, project day. We're going to knock out so many projects. And Matt's like, we're going to hang out and watch football. I'm like, please get off the couch because I have a to-do list a mile long. And he's like, I thought we were hanging out at the house today. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that that is so eye-opening for people and sets you free to avoid so many of these miscommunications or unmet expectations or conflict. I've told so many of my friends that you taught me that. That's awesome. Because— it's hard, and I, and I don't think most people understand that. So help break that down for us of, like, what's going on in our mind and, and why that's at play. So I learned it from—I just ran across an old psychiatrist who had sworn off psychiatry in grad school. Okay. And it was, it was one of those flippant lines that he just said, I can solve most marriage— much marriage dysfunction in about two sessions. And I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. And I read it. Again, the skeptic. <laughs> yeah. And he just said, we think in pictures, but we speak in words. And that— all of relational dysfunction is people just flying by each other, mm-hmm. right? And so he said, you can solve all marriages by just starting every day with what's your picture of today look like? And I was like, that sounds so stupid. So I just did it at my house. And it changed everything in yeah. my house because Sheila would come up to me in the morning on a Monday and look me right and be <laughs> like, this Friday, I'm going the greatest date of our life. Be ready. And I was like, oh my God. I'm super ready, right, right? right? And by Monday, I'm thinking about what I'm going to wear. By right. Tuesday, Wednesday, and most of Thursday, I'm wondering what she's going to wear. Right. What helicopter are we going to take to what <laughs> right. hotel? Do I need to rent a tux? I don't uh, know. The, like <laughs> The kids, like my son's 10 or 11. I don't even care how old he is. They'll be fine. They won't yeah. die. <laughs> and then on Friday, she rolls out and sweats in a T-shirt and her hair in a ponytail. And she's like, <laughs> it's Taco Friday, baby. <laughs> I'm going to have so many burritos. Ben and Jerry's on the couch. Yes. And I'm, like, like, and I'm in a in a suit, and she's like, "You look like an idiot. We're going to get tacos. What are you doing?" I love tacos. She likes romantic getaways, but whoosh, we went right past each other. Yeah. And then I get angry. I get frustrated. I've had this whole thing built up. She's like, "Why all you want is?" And now we're off to the races, mm-hmm. right? And so now we start every day of our lives with that one question. Do you really right? do it every day? Hey, what's okay. your picture of today look like? Because wow. it's as simple as Hank's got baseball practice today. My son, I instantly think, cool. She's going to get him there and home. Yeah. And she instantly thinks, you're the baseball guy. Mm-hmm. You're going to figure out how to get home from work. 
and then suddenly it's 5.30, I'm racing home, she's frustrated, I'm frustrated, and all we could have, we could have solved all that at 7.15 that morning by saying, hey, what's your picture today look like? Wow. Hank's got practice. You, can you get that? Can I get that? And it's over. Yeah. The, the conversation's off to the, And you can done. do it with anything. You can anything. do it with date night, with how do you start your day, with what are our plans for this weekend. We're going to go on vacation. What does this vacation look like to you? Um, it's funny, Matt and I just got back from vacation. Speaking of, um, we went to Fort Lauderdale for our, every year we go on like a few-day trip for our anniversary. Oh. And so I told him leading up to this trip, because I've had a very hard six to eight months here and at home and all the things. And I was like, and you know, COVID, lots lots of family time all together, all of us, <laughs> all five of us. And so I was like, I just, I just want to rest. Like, I just want to rest. I probably said it 100 times. I couldn't have been more clear. <laughs> so every day when it's literally like 8 a.m. and he's like, and I am asleep because I'm sleeping until 10 a.m. Yeah. every day because I never get to do this my whole life. And it became this running joke. He's like, I mean, have you had enough sleep? I was like, I was very clear. I was very clear that this was a trip of rest for me. But it's amazing how when you can just communicate what you need or what you expect, or like, oh, if we expect different things, let's fix it on the front end. So you use the words, I need rest. Mm -hmm. And he heard, she needs rest. Yeah, and we're gonna lay picture, by the pool. <laughs> his picture of rest is we're gonna go hang out. Right, 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 us, right, right, right. There's no kids. And your picture of rest is I'm, I'm in bed. I'm actually asleep. asleep. Those curtains are drawn I until I'm ready to get up. And my guess is if you had said, hey, I'm gonna sleep until 10 or 11 every day, yeah. that's my picture of this. Yeah. You can go do whatever you want. Yeah. You'd be like, sweet, this is awesome. Yeah. And vice versa, right? It's just having that 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 next what layer saying, like? what's this actually look like? Yeah. Paint a picture. We're gonna go on a trip. We're gonna hang out with your in laws. We're gonna retire someday. Yeah. We're gonna, I wanna get a dream house. Mm -hmm. Just stop for a second and talk about what's that picture look like. That is such a great tip for all of you guys watching and listening. Use this with your spouse, but even friendships. Like, hey, we're making plans for a, a girl's night. Okay, what does that look like to you? Like, what do you, you know, whatever. And so I just, I love how tactical it is, but how it has an actual result in the outcome and the less conflict, more communication, more. Met, expectations being met and so on. Okay, how does, I know you talk a lot about anxiety and you write on anxiety and um, you have a book, Redefining Anxiety. How does conflict affect our anxiety? How does conflict affect our anxiety levels where it's like, because it makes us uncomfortable, because we go into the spider or flight, we, we live in a world where people are more anxious than ever before. How does this play into to what you're seeing and what you're helping people with? So when we go into conflict, when we feel threatened, our thinking part of our brain goes offline. Mm -hmm. Like our our body has the one logic. job and that's to keep us safe, yeah. right? And that may mean running or Enneagram aiding and coming <laughs> at, I'm coming at, I'm coming through yeah. you. That's all yeah. I got. Yeah. Um, and so when it goes off, it just starts sounding the alarms. Part of that is anxiety. Mm -hmm. The other part of conflict is we shove that stuff down and then when our frontal lobe comes back online, Oh my gosh, we start ruminating and having conversations. You just stew. That we are never gonna have in real life. Yes. And we always win the conversations. And I have I like. I've had so many of these. <laughs> yes. And what's so great, here's a fun thing about Christy is <laughs> you so have them and you win them, and then you you load all the gun up, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Can't wait. Oh yeah. And then the moment <laughs> somebody walks by and they're like, hey, it's good to see you, Christy. It's like Oh, is it? <laughs> it's super on, right? And so, um, and I'm the opposite. I'm, I, I load the gun up, yeah. and the moment my wife says, hey, you're home early. I'm like, oh, because I'm always late, and I'm that husband. I'm not that I'm super, and I'm out. I disappear. I'm yeah. out of here, guys. She's right? like, what did I do? And so we ruminate, and we think ruminating, we think stewing on this stuff is, uh, quote, unquote, good thinking, because we're thinking about we're our processing spouse. processing it. We're just processing we're, it. Just we're thinking about work and how <laughs> yeah. busy we are. It is a complete and utter waste of time. Mm. It's a waste of time. It's dangerous. And so that it just builds. And so think of anxiety as like as a nuclear reactor, just building and building and building. That's going to come out on somebody, yeah. right? And so we spend too much time in our head or we are fighting and fleeing. And it's one of those two things. And those alarms are just ringing all day long, all day long. And going back to sitting down with someone and say, hey, what's your picture for budget night tonight? Mm -hmm. Just something simple. Yeah. Or yeah. after the fact, I had this picture of our date last night. It, it didn't end up being that way. I'll own that I wasn't super clear about what I needed. Mm -hmm. And next time we're going to say, like, what's our picture of this thing? I'll be super right. clear next year that I want to sleep till 10 a.m. every yeah, yeah, yeah. day. <laughs> okay, so I've got a question, and, and I know we need to wrap it up, but I love talking to you about this. This is so helpful. Um, literally last night, speaking of real time, uh, my son came in because the power went out because of storms. He came in because the sound machine was off, so I went back in. I get back in bed. It's 2 a.m. I can't go back to sleep. Mm. 
because once I wake up, my mind is going. And it's, it's seriously, it's worrying about work stuff and conversations I had yesterday and emails I've got to send tomorrow and things I've got to deal with. And, and then you start panicking and not, not being able to go to sleep. But whether it's in the middle of the night or during the day, how do you stop those thoughts? Mm. We all have them. Yep. We're all stewing, we're processed, whatever. How, how can you, as much as you can, stop your thoughts from spiraling oh, and, and reduce that tightness in your chest, the panic, the fight or flight you're going into? How can we control? Control that to some level. Yeah. So at 2 a.m., there's a lot of research on this. It's wonderful. At 2 a.m., get up. Really? Okay. Yeah. We're a lot of that. That's so discouraging. Oh, it is. It is. <laughs> I'm so depressed now. But we're a lot of that anxiety starts to build, that yeah. pressure starts to build. I've got to sleep. I've got to sleep. I've got to sleep. I've got to sleep. sleep. And then your body floods itself with cortisol and adrenaline, which is the exact opposite of going to sleep. Right. You are basically so awake at that point. So get up, yeah. right, and separate yourself from this moment. Okay. If they're going, if they're going, I will take a piece of paper and write them down. Okay. Right? And so we we, we did this back when people experienced some really rough trauma. Mm-hmm. And their body just started taking off on them to write down, are you okay right now? Mm. Are you safe right now? Mm. Did this happen? Yep. <clears throat> are you safe right now? And then there's this thing that has been that has revolutionized my head, which is once I acknowledge that thought, I get to choose whether I'm going to keep worshiping it or not. And that's Good. hard. It is right? hard. It's the thing you have to continually remind yourself yes. of, right? It's not like you just learn it once. I, I've got to have a hard <laughs> conversation with Dave. i got to have it. i got to have it. And I'm going to say it like this, and then I'm off to the races. Mm-hmm. I can write it down. i got to have a hard conversation with Dave. This is 2.15 a.m., mm-hmm. And it's not going to be right now. Yep. Anything after that is a choice, Christy. Okay. And I got to keep choosing. Nope. Nope. Sometimes my wife will have, I'll say, she'll see me walk through the house and I'll be like, nope. Like, I'll say it out loud. <laughs> out loud. I'm talking to myself. <laughs> yeah. We're not doing this. She's like, this. my husband is insane. He's, it's he's a lunatic, right? <laughs> yeah. But I'm not doing this. I'm not <laughs> setting off. If I can't control it right now, if yeah. I can't get involved in it now, I'm not going to give it the space. Yeah. And what I've found over the last four, five, six years, and it's a practice, your brain goes, cool. Okay. I got this. You gain more control. Here's a great it. signal. So we'd walk into, it, it, when I used to do crisis work, we'd walk into, Christy, some of those awful scenes you can imagine. And there'd be somebody or two or three people who've just experienced unimaginable horror. And our partner would talk to, to one of them, and I'd see her across the room, and she would just go, which is, this person is completely limbic. They are on, they are back in what just happened. Mm-hmm. Got to get them here. Mm-hmm. And we would do things like check out the colors of the carpet, count the ceiling tiles, what do you let's see? go for a what do you walk. Hear? Yep. I need to make sure you're here. Right. And then once they're here, their brain goes, cool, we're safe. Okay. And it's out. Interesting. And oof, right? Interesting. So what are those things we can do right now? Interesting. And what I found is if you get up, let's go read a book. Okay. And think of sleep. And this has been a savior for me because I struggle with sleep, Christy, is I look at sleep in two or three or four day increments. Occasionally, I wake up at 2 a.m. I don't fight it anymore. Yeah. I just get some reading and writing done. Okay. And because I know, and I'm still going to work out that morning. Mm-hmm. I'm going to push through. That day is going to be a challenge, and then I'm going to go to sleep that night. My body will, will, will re-regulate itself. Yeah. It's when I get up at 2 a.m. I go like this, and I just lay there, and I listen to Sheila, my wife, sleeping. Oh, Matt, sleep more so mad, good. more mad. It's and I'm like, so maddening. <laughs> and then I I go up and sleep in the guest room, and then all the way up, I'm like, oh, I got to sleep. Oh, guest room. Real okay. cool, dude, yep. right? Great. Real cool. Great. And then I get down like a Netflix rabbit hole. Everything's chaos. <laughs> and instead of doing that, I just get up and I'm like, I'll sleep tomorrow. It's cool. I'm not going to yeah. fight it anymore. Yeah. This is so helpful. Um, okay, you have a book, Redefining Anxiety. So for people that are listening right now and they're going, man, I, I really struggle with that thing you're talking about. Not just conflict, but that like fight or flight, the tension, the anxiety, and I don't know what to do with it and they want to learn more. How can they find your book and follow you and learn more about how to, how to cope with this? You can go to johndeloney.com and it's right there. There's like a little button that says buy now. I don't, I'm still learning how the internet's work. You, you <laughs> click in it and then they'll Plural. just send it right to your house. It's so good. Um, and you can follow me at John Deloney too, where we're just covering a lot of relationship, mental health stuff. Everything yeah. that's trying to help All people the weird, be whole. Yeah. All the weird questions you get. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Are you game for a very quick rapid fire? Pardon. <laughs> I'm like so excited. Let's do it. I'm so excited. I can't even say it. Are you ready for a rapid fire question? Let's do it. I told you before we even started this episode that I'm super excited about this with you just because you're weird and you will answer things <laughs> weird. Okay. I'm going to start really super normal. Um, what is your favorite band? Ah, uh, some probably some old metal band. Yep. I love old metal bands. Uh, first thing you do in the morning, not at 2 a.m. on a normal morning. Gosh, I go down and I have like this meditation mat and I write in a gratitude journal and I have this. You have a meditation mat? Yeah. It's like an (laughs) old folded quilt in this little secret cubby I made in the basement. 
<laughs> the visual of this is so amazing. Okay. <laughs> it's, um, it's so weird because I'm so like, yeah, it's part. But it starts with like gratitude. Metal band and a quilt. Quiet. Yes, it is. <laughs> this is what I mean by you. Okay, my next question was going to be a weird thing about you that no one knows. But I feel like we've covered that. But just give me a new one. What's <sighs> a weird thing about you most people don't know? I love Disney movie. I, I love <laughs> I, I love melodramatic thematic um, songs and movies, and I cry in movies a lot. Great. I love it. <laughs> okay, um, something about you that really gets on Sheila's nerves. Like what's like like what's something that like? Thing? <laughs> what? How long do we have? <laughs> I can walk through life relatively unaware. Oh. She says I leave a trail of John just through the oh. world. And she says she can tell what season I'm in. Okay. Whether I'm entering into a writing season or a speaking season or okay. a fun season by just she did this the other night. She just like, things aren't are you okay? I was yeah. like, why do you always ask me? I'm great. And then she just said, and she <laughs> looked in our room and it looked it looked like some, I would have probably shown up and been like, you should probably go get some help. Yeah. And I was like, oh my, and she's like, they just start stacking things. But yeah. So I just leave a trail of John everywhere. Okay. When I'm off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. off there. Uh, what is a pet peeve that you have? Other than the Enneagram. <laughs> my, my, my number one pet peeve on planet Earth is disrespectful people. Okay. People who turn humans into issues. Mm. Does that make sense? That's deep. I feel like that just it leads us into a new episode next, for next time. Ragey. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, let's lighten it up a bit as okay. we wrap up. Last question. <laughs> uh, what makes you feel balanced? Whatever that means to you. What makes you feel balanced? You know, I'm talking about this more and more. So I love hearing from people. What does that mean to you? Oh, man. A season of, like, when I am laughing hard. Mm. And it happens seasonally for me. Mm -hmm. That I'll read something and I'll, somebody will post something on Instagram only use of Instagram in the world is for funny internet memes. And you'll scroll them, and there'll be a season where I'll be like, that's funny. And for whatever reason, there's a season where I will, like, double over. I can't breathe, and I send it to everyone I know. Yeah. And they don't think it's near as funny as it. So it's a season, and usually that's when I'm exercising and writing and taking care of my relationships. Mm. I'm doing the things that keep me whole mm. so that I can swing off the world and find hilarious, funny things yeah. and be fully alive. Just a lightness to it. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Oh my gosh, John, this is so fun. You're Thanks so for hanging Thanks, out. Man, so this rad. is Thank awesome. You. We're going to go back to our desk upstairs where that's where we actually work and live. But I, <laughs> Thank you for hanging out on this but set here's with the thing, me. It will be just like this. I know, it was. This would. is awesome. Um, okay, johndeloney.com. Yes. What are you on Instagram so people can follow you? At John Deloney. Again, super creative. Yeah, All right. That's awesome. Thanks for hanging Thank out. Thanks you, for Christine. being here. Appreciate it's awesome. It. All right, y'all. I don't know about you, but there have been multiple times in my life where I have felt like I lost myself. Whether it was because of a difficult season or through all my roles and responsibilities and commitments, at the end of the day, I would look up and just wonder, I don't even know who I am anymore. If you've ever felt like that, I hear you. In fact, that's the very reason I wrote my new devotional, Living True, 40 Days to Get Back to You. Through this 40-day journey, I wanna help you reset and refocus on scripture and what God says about you. This is gonna help you get back to you and get back to who He created you to be. You can get your copy of Living True 40 Days to Get Back to You at christywright.com. All right, y'all, I'm so excited because I'm gonna answer some of the questions that you have sent in through social media. And this is from my magic bowl of questions. So I don't know what's in here, but we're gonna see what you guys have sent in. All right, first one here. What do you do when you initially say yes to a task or job and then they add more to it than you expected? And when you later explain that it's beyond your time capacity, they won't take no for an answer. Here's what's so fascinating about this. Sometimes when you guys ask questions, there are assumptions baked into them. So I wanna read one part of this one more time so you can really catch this. They won't take no for an answer. Well, it's your time. So they don't really have a choice, right? Like, it doesn't matter what they think they will take no for an answer or not because it's your time. They can't make you do anything, and they're not going to. Now, here's what I would do because this is a really difficult situation where you say yes to something, and then after the fact, you want to say no. That's a really common scenario. Maybe some of you all have been in where you commit to something, and man, when it comes right down to it, I don't want to do that whether it's because they increase the scope of what they're asking or you've overcommitted yourself and you really regret it, what do you do in those scenarios? I wanna give you two options. One option is you go through with it. You honor your word. Now, in this scenario, because they have increased the scope, 
you want to let them know you're not going to go through with it and here's why and so on. You're willing to follow through with the initial agreement, but not this new thing they're asking of you. But if it's just some commitment, you agree to volunteer to host a party, you agree to volunteer um, to bring some meals to um, some banquet, you agree to do something and you don't want to follow through or you can't or you're tired or whatever the thing is. The first option is you actually follow through and do it anyway and honor your word. The second option is you respectfully try to decline, back out of it, and find someone else to do it. Say, hey, I'm so sorry. I have overcommitted myself. I thought I could follow through with this, and this is something I'm just not able to do. I would love to find someone else to host, someone else to serve, someone else to show up. The bottom line is you want to honor your part of any deal. So if you give someone your word, you need to honor it by showing up or fi- finding someone to fill in, being honest that you made the mistake to overcommit if you decide to do that. So in any situation, you wanna honor your word. But if the other person is increasing the ask, if the other person is increasing the scope, I see this all the time in women that run businesses. My mom would see this all the time. Someone comes in, let's say it's a bride and she wants to get a wedding cake and she goes, oh, I just want a small little cake that's gonna serve 50 people and very simple roses. And so my mom says to her, okay, that'll be $95, great. Well, then the bride comes back a week later. Actually, I want it to serve 200 people and I want it to have a mosaic of my husband and I's face on it out of icing and out of petals and it's gonna have real greenery and it's gonna have six tiers. Okay, well, that's a different price. That's a different time commitment. So whether it's in business or in life, if someone increases their ask of you, the scope, the time, the cost, whatever it is from you, then you need to meet them there. Either you need to meet them there with the cost in your business of what you're charging for that thing, or you need to meet them there and let them know you're not able to do it at that level. Hey, I agreed to this and I'm still able to honor this, but I'm not able to meet you at this new ask, at this new request. But when you say they won't take no for an answer, I disagree. They will take no for an answer if you don't give them any choice but to take no for an answer. All right, let's see what we got here. How do I keep up with that successful and motivated person I once was? I don't know if you're watching right now if this was your question or if you're watching and listening and you feel the same way. But I just want to start by saying, you are successful. Right now. Right where you are. You may not feel motivated. (laughs) You may be in a season where you feel like you're stuck or in a slump or you're not achieving as much as you're used to or you're not performing to the level you expect of yourself, but I just want to reframe that for you. You are successful right now where you are, doing what's right for you in this season. And motivation is one of those things that you can rekindle in yourself. Maybe it's you revisit your why. Why are you doing what you're doing? What are you working on next? What's your vision for the future or the goals that are gonna get you excited again? Maybe it's something that you drum up in yourself. Maybe it's something where you put on some good music, you have a dance party, and you just decide to get yourself fired up even if you don't feel fired up. I'll tell you, every single evening when I come downstairs after putting our three kids to bed with my husband, Matt, and the kitchen is a mess from dinner, We've just finished baths and bedtime. We come downstairs, the kitchen is a mess. We have to clean the mess and we have to make lunches. And it's like 7.30 at night. We've worked all day. We've gone nonstop, been on our feet. We've just done the whole nighttime routine, which is an hour and a half of exhaustion for those of you parents that of little kids know. And I'm not motivated to clean the kitchen at all. I'm not motivated to make lunches for the 497th time, but I've got to. And so truly, I will go downstairs, I will say, Alexa, play Black Eyed Peas, I will put on some party music, and I will just decide to get myself geared up to do this thing that I need to do once again. So whether you dig deep and you cast a vision and set goals and revisit your why for what will get you excited again about what you're working on and where you're going, or it's something as simple, practical, and tactical as putting on some good music, maybe going for a walk around the neighborhood, doing something to get yourself energized for the day and for the task in front of you. It's up to you to keep yourself motivated. I love how Zig Ziglar says, people say motivation doesn't last. Well, neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it daily. (laughs) And so it's up to you to keep yourself motivated and find what motivates you but I do wanna remind you that you are successful. Don't get discouraged and tell yourself that you're not. 
just because your life looks different in this season than it used to. This might be a new version of success that you're achieving, you just don't know it yet. All right, y'all, thanks so much for joining me. And of course, for more encouragement on becoming the person you want to be, you can visit christywright.com.